Okay, take two. So, I, so I was just welcoming everybody, Amanda, on uh, behalf of the centre uh, and also the origin of this lying in uh, the industrial action that many of us are taking, where all good things happen. And it's rather sad to be having this meeting on the day after, you know, particularly my colleague Amanda Slevin and others in from Friends of the Earth and a whole variety of environmental activist groups. Um, we got the first climate change bill in Northern Ireland over the line yesterday. Um, and that's a good uh, piece of news story. But then we contrast that to the desecration that's happening along uh, the lagging. So the aim of tonight is that we're going to host the event on behalf of uh, the centre that Amanda and I run. As I said, we're more than happy to have more meetings around this. I think the university has a lot of inert capital and resources that I think community groups should be using. After all, your taxes pay for my wages, so I hope you like the, the service you're going to get here um, tonight. Um, but also, as well as being a, I'm a professor here in the, the School of History, uh, but I'm also a recovering politician. Um, but I do so shines of recidivism, I think. I was a Green Party councillor out in uh, North Down for seven years, and it's probably as much of that that I can offer to the group in terms of a strategy and a campaign, um, in terms of, A, I think we can use the uh, resources of the institution here. Um, we maybe even get, if you're interested, try and get students involved in terms of documenting the desecration, you know, calling out the Department of Infrastructure for being stuck in a hard engineering solution when there's nature based and softer ways of dealing with this. But I do think this is where good things happen in terms of links being made because it's exhausting doing an environmental or other campaign, as many of you may know. And my first piece of advice to you is that it's OK to rest and have a drink now and again. You know, there's a sense in which when you're, you're in the activist mode, you think every waking hour has to be given to the cause. That actually is not a very productive way of proceeding. So do give yourself a rest, make links with other groups, you know, and hopefully the university and what we're doing here tonight can help give you some additional resources. You know, for example, if you wanted an eminent professor from the university, John Barry, to come and be in front of the BBC, more than happy uh, in saying, how can Belfast City Council, I'll finish on, on this, how can Belfast City Council, which has declared a climate and ecological emergency in October 2019, first of all, how would anyone in the city of Belfast know what that means? You know, most of us live in, in Belfast, yet they have these declarations, but nothing actually happens except the bad things. How is that consistent with these declarations and so on? How is the destruction that's going on down uh, the lagging consistent with the, the spirit of the climate change bill that's been passed yesterday? The good news for you in terms of time is that uh, politicians are acutely sensitised when they're coming up to an election. And I think that certainly one concrete suggestion you may think of doing, and we can host it here at the university, is to have a hustings event that is organised by Save Our Lagan and those uh, citizens who are concerned about what's going on, where we invite in those prospective local candidates and ask them publicly what their views are, what are they going to do? Because you've, you've probably found, I had to be honest, I used to do this myself as a councillor, where people listen to your pain, uh, pain and sympathy, uh, but shag all happens. And I think, you know, we are way past that. You deserve an awful lot better in terms of action on, on this issue. So you're all very welcome. I hope this is going to be the first of many meetings. Uh, do see myself or indeed Teresa or Amanda as the academics here. We're your post people into the university. There are lots of really clever people here who could be helpful to you. You know, as you know yourself, you know, a 10 minute conversation with somebody who knows what they're talking about can save you a lot of time. You know, as I say, it is, uh, you know, it, there is a kind of a, the loneliness of the long distance runner element of a campaign where you need to sustain yourselves and find allies. I can't speak for all my colleagues, but I hope tonight is some demonstration to you as local citizens that there are at least some academics who give a shit, who are willing to either bring the community in, as we're doing here tonight, or actually go out as well to help support you. Because we are living at a momentous period of human history globally in terms of the planetary crisis. Now, what we're talking about here is a local example of that. How in the name of God can we start to deal with the larger ecological problems of the sixth great mass extinction event that's happening across the planet when we can't even take care of local trees? 
with historical and ecological value. So I think, you know, we can have uh, lots of fun uh, doing this as well. Let's always put the fun into fundamentalism in terms of, you know, demanding uh, a fairly reasonable um, outcome, which is please don't be cutting down trees. It's very, very simple and so on. So you're all very welcome. And I'm going to hand over now to Teresa. Yes, thank you, John. Thank you, John. And welcome also to those who are joining us online. There's a hand up. I don't know whether they need to say anything, but thank you all for coming here today. Uh, we are very happy to have this event. As John said, we thought about this as a way of uh, on the picket line, as a way of connecting different groups who are working on the environment at this time in this land and we would like to build some momentum and uh, connect us all so that we can maybe have a strategy or share strategies uh, 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 to possibly change the legal system. The meeting was kept private to in, uh, uh, for those who were invited only so that we could have a focused discussion really, uh, 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 not for any other reason. The event will run in this way. We suggest that each group has a representative who can present their campaign here for five to eight minutes. Uh, and then we will have the intervention of another colleague of mine, Dr. Vivienne Gravy, who unfortunately needs to leave at uh, 7.45, so I will give her the, the, the floor uh, just uh, before uh, that so that she can leave on time. And then after we resume with the groups, some will be speaking online, some will be speaking from here. And at the very end, we can have uh, strategies and advice from John and Amanda. Uh, they are just, Amanda in particular led uh, the uh, successful achievement with the climate change bill. And so uh, uh, we are on a positive note uh, uh, with that. Thank you again, without any further ado now, Colin, do you want to say anything? There will be plenty of space for discussion. Oh, yeah. I'll keep it very short because I realise we, we're having a dinner with three, three, uh, three starters. So I'll keep it very, very short. Um, obviously, the the main voices we need to hear are the, those who are the campaigners. Um, this all started really uh, for me personally as the sort of accidental um, activist when emerging from the pandemic, two years of following the science, we were myself and other uh, people living locally were, were so the spectacle of you know hundreds of years of tree growth being fed into a wood chipper in the name of um, climate change. It was explained to us very patiently what that meant. Kind of makes sense now but that the shock you know they're absolutely the, the feeling of powerlessness and confusion just never left me and I hope it never does because it, it made somebody like me who really took all of these things for completely for granted something as beautiful as powerful as a tree as permanent as a tree was just immensely vulnerable so i think we we can i think we can learn from each other and i hope we can uh, share tools the, the 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 body of knowledge that people like kathy from stop the tree stop the top the things she's learned we need to learn um, from through an I'm very late to this fight. There are people who have been at this for years and years and years. So I realise it's it's it's, it's a, we have to catch up. A lot of us have to catch up. And the the other thing we need to give each other is hope, because I think these challenges are overwhelming. Just like John said, you know, it can be very um, disturbing. You know, the things that we that we share these are disturbing things, and and the the the, the these challenges seem to be completely intractable but we've met each other and we're talking and hopefully this will be a productive and one of many that should be absolutely fantastic so let's give each other hope so with that i could ask fiona to if you'd like to come and, and start fiona's from uh, friends of lagging lands east she's she's early to the bat battle she's a hardy campaigner and uh, very very welcome thank you so much no unaccustomed as I am to public speaking so bear with me <laughs> I haven't done this in a long long time and especially with all this high-tech stuff which is uh, 
Um, so my name is Fiona McKinley and I uh, got involved, I've been involved in things like, you know, sort of global things like trying to save Antarctica, go down and getting petitions in Belfast City Centre years ago whenever it was all done by paper, uh, various things like around the time reinforcing stuff. And now you realise that the extinction is happening on our own door doorsteps and every time you go for a walk, another bit of green space is gone, another development built on it um, and it's just death by a thousand cuts. And OK, some people say, look, you live in a city, you know, Belfast City Council is determined to raise the population, you know, by another 60, 60,000, I think, in the next few years. So they want to build, build, build. Um, there's still have plenty of brownfield sites to build on, so why they're looking at greenfield is beyond any explanation and totally abhorrent. But a, the thing that um, you realise that there's that pressure on every city, Lisburn's going to join Belfast, all this is just going to become like Northern Ireland will be half, half a city by the time all this joins up. But it's whenever I see trees and all the effort that's going in by the Woodland Trust and Belfast Hills Partnership to be planting saplings in their thousands, trying to find land to do it on. And then you look up above and there's somebody building a house and they've got a forest behind them, big oak trees lying sideways and they're all really healthy. There's no reason for it apart from they just want you know, um, a site for bigger cars and stuff, so a bigger car park. So it's it's just the whole um, paradox of living in this, as John um, said, that you declare a you declare oh sorry you declare an extinction, you know, biodiversity extinction and a climate change crisis. Uh, we put out all the stuff on the websites about how committed they are to it, and then you really get into the nitty gritty of how the whole planning system works and how the Northern Ireland Environment Agency works. And you realise that they don't have the word protection in their name for a reason, because it's basically in Northern Ireland, they de developers will always win. The whole planning system is built inherently to favour development and the environment, no matter what they're saying now, and they're all their public. Am I okay? Yeah. Um, in all their publicity stuff and their latest documents and their biodiversity, their green and blue plans and stuff, you look at what they're passing. Um, and no matter what councillors you talk to, who are appalled at the amount of building and the amount of destruction and the amount of trees getting cut down and the amount of concrete, that they are having to vote for something that they think is totally wrong. And some people are leaving. Some councillors are actually leaving the planning committee because of this, because they are, um, their hands are totally tied by a system. And that is where, I mean, I could talk for an hour about everything to do with Hampton Park. It is um, pretty ancient meadows right up um, on the other side of the towpath. The most fantastic, what would have, should have been, what was and what should have been kept as the most important wildlife refuge, probably within South Belfast, if not all of Greater Belfast. Um, it's a uh, team with biodiversity, but as part of the map, um, it got um, zoned for housing. So once that happens, um, the land just becomes, instead of a thousand pounds an acre, it's like 10,000, 100,000 pounds an acre if you're going to build Millionaire's Row. So it's that that you're fighting against. And somebody uh, high up in the council said to me, Fiona, pick your battles, but you need to always remember that in our system in Northern Ireland, you will never, ever win on the grounds of the environment. Don't ever think that you have environmental protection in this country because whenever you look at how they will go recommend approval, um, this problem can be mitigated against and you see that over and over and over again, even down to stuff like bat roosts and bat forage and then badgers. It's, it's, it's so shocking that you can't really believe what you're reading. You're just seeing it over and over again. And this is where the councillors and the planning committee, some of them are pro-development and will vote for anything, any bit of concrete anywhere, but a lot of them aren't. But whenever they see planning services and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency um, saying everything's tickety-boo, the developers you know, commissioned an environmental statement, we rolled out an environmental impact assessment because it was just below two hectares, so it didn't need one. And it's just all, everybody knows how to play the system. 
And for any of us to fight this individually, it's impossible because you have to learn the system. And there's an awful lot that you don't know about what goes on behind closed doors as well. So it's the only way that we can save meadows as precious as lagging meadows or further trees or, I mean, you could, you could just do a list of all the stuff that you see being destroyed left, right and centre. But the only way that we can ever deal with that rather than everybody individually fighting and learning and trying to get, you nearly need to be a civil engineer one day and an ecologist the next and then, you know, a lobbyist the next day and it just takes over your life and you feel that if you lose, you're crushed and you'll never, ever fight anything again. And this is what developers rely on, the burnout of any campaigners. But if you go back to the root of the problem is our planning system, our department, DARE, Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. They're the ones, and this goes back, Edwin Fitz was responsible for this even back whenever he was Minister of the DOE. He brought in planning policies and regulations that we're suffering from now. They, the DUP also blocked an environment and protection agency back in 2008. The climate change bill, they blocked that as well. That was Arlene Foster's uh, ministerial achievement. So the, the only way that we can do anything to try and save what we can, and I think it is just meadow by meadow, tree by tree, is just coalescing into a group that everybody networks and everybody learns and everybody shares all that knowledge. And they, like we found out that we could access the cedar and priority species list. And whenever we looked at the record, of the priority, the, the species that were on these meadows and in Lag and Lands East, it bore absolutely no similarity to the species that three end, so called independent um, ecological consultants um, commissioned by the developer. Um, it bore no, it, the contradictions were just staggering. So it was um, in one uh, environmental statement that said that Lag and Meadows was just like a amenity, poor quality amenity grassland that had been tarmacked over and was just used by dog walkers and a photograph of exactly that bit of it. That was addressing the bit that the developer had built on in the first place to um, put, put his stamp on that he had got grant permission and nobody was going to overturn it. But I digress because I'm going down the Hampton and if I go down that road, you'll never stop me. You'll be here in the midnight. So, um, the th two things. Uh, the one thing I found out in Hampton Park is that there were only three objections. We put it up in next door and you, um, basically it went up to about 400 to 300 and something objections. And that was by basically um, the benefit of next door is it's local, it's neighbourly, it's civil, you can't be trolled, you can get photographs up, you can get good but you know bits of information you're not um, you know, stuck by a card account, although some people could say I could be doing with one next door. But the, the thing is that you realise that all the comments that come in, all the agrees, the likes, and um, sorry, stop. Two minutes, right, two minutes, okay. Go, go, go. Thank you. I told her to do that on the slide. <laughs> and I told him to pull me off if I didn't go in two minutes. Um, the, uh, the thing was that you realise that um, Every, the vast majority of people thought they could not object to it because in the planning sense of who can object, it was the neighbours whose gardens just backed on to the new development, which was some houses in the Panton Park, some in Mornington. So the letters were sent out to a few people and it was only through walking the dog that you realised and then you, you were told, um, but you not know there's another planning application then? They're going to build more houses on top of the first ones that they haven't started building already. Bearing in mind this was all land banked. They started in 2007, financial crisis 2008. They uh, basically started the job, stopped it, land banked it until the prices all went up again. So it wasn't really essential housing. Um, but uh, so, they, so going back to the root of the problem is the whole planning system, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, which is not fit for purpose, and uh, the, basically an environmental protection agency is essential to um, take the Northern Ireland Environment Agency to account, basically, and to oversee everything they do and to question why they are recommending something for approval when it is obviously um, an environmental crime, but it can be mitigated against, it's just um, they're repeated. So it's looking at um, 
the whole planning reform, but also looking at agriculture as well, because the agriculture um, reform and the way farmers are treating land, whether they have to because to make money, um, it's obviously Tesco's that are making the most, Tesco's and other supermarkets are making the most money out of food production. And that is forcing farmers, even up in the glens, who do sheep farming. And I wonder why there's no wildflowers and huge big spheres of the glens anymore. There's none of the insects. This is where I'm from. So um, there's none of the insects, none of the wildlife that I remember. The birds are all, I'm going now. The birds are all gone. And you realise that even in um, the glens of Antrim, the land is being intensively farmed to the extent that it's all, all the grass is sprayed with herbicide because it's grass resistant now. Then sheep, you know, feed on it. Then it's all cut for silage up in the big plastic bags. So there's no hay making, there's no wildflowers, there's no seed distribution. No. So, and then they come out and the adults salt and danger, they cover it all with slurry and that kills all the worms and poisons the land. So we've got intensive farming and somewhere that you think would be the least intensively farmed. And then you wonder why the biodiversity extinction crisis is happening across farmland, not just within cities. And that is the thing that every bit of meadow, every bit of garden, anything you can do in a garden is so precious because if if it, if it goes the way of intensifying farming even more for them to make any kind of living out of it, then things like this, we cannot build on land like this and we have to plan a system that will stop that and an NIEA um, that will stop it or else just be disbanded and we'll start again. Can I go now? Yeah. Did you say how is it going? Hello. Where, where, where are we? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. You put that on. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Now, uh, do you have time to listen to one more or? or sh sh Yeah. <laughs> Shall we go online? Yes. Who who could um let's say um so can who the yeah how do you pronounce it? Gwembara? Wimbara. Wimbara, yes. Can you please can you please put your camera on so that we can see you as well? Well, no, I can't really because that's okay. we're trying that's okay. to keep that's our campaign um, as impersonal as possible because... Yes, that's fine. We'll put the slides on then. Great. Uh, can you turn the volume up a wee bit? Okay, yes, we can. Yes, yes. Uh, just uh, can you hear me if I speak this way or? Yeah, yeah. No, I can hear you. It's just I have to keep the, the phone okay. up to my ear. Now, now you have the floor. You can tell us about your campaign. Uh, we are yeah, all... Well, the Guibara Conservation Group was founded back in 1999 and uh, the Guibara is um, a glacial rift valley in the middle of Donegal with a 20 kilometre uh, salmon River, one of the last remaining salmon rivers in Ireland, really, if we be truthful about it, and certainly in Ulster. And um, we were concerned at that time about aquacultural developments of oysters, which of course are Pacific oysters and not native oysters. So that was one of the first campaigns we got involved in. Then we have had in the last 10 or 15 years, we've had two attempts by mining companies. They got prospecting licenses, but they didn't get the prospect because they were basically chased by the local people. Then we've had um, two or three wind farm applications in this glacial valley. It's in the Natura 2000 River, part of the Ardra Moss Natura 2000 site. And um, we have so many Annex 1 species that uh, I had to become a wildlife photographer to prove that they were here. From red deer, red grouse, pine marten, red squirrels, uh, golden eagles, buzzards, 
parrots and falcons, kestrels, you name it, and we have it here, woodcock. And uh, we even had an osprey last year, so we're hoping to see the osprey return, a non-tagged osprey. So it's a very special place. And in Donegal and in most of the Republic, the only people that are doing the polluting or the big polluters in Donegal are the state because they're the ones planting the uplands with peat conifers. And then when they, which they started here back in the 40s, it was one of the, one of the some of these town lands were the first to be forested with conifers. They're now into probably their third rotation. And even though we've suggested it a million times, um, that the land along one river bank should be returned to native trees, like all the town land names indicate. This just ignores that, and this continual planting of conifer monocultures on rivers is just, it's terrible because it's the acidification that it causes. Then we have the multinational corporations wanting to put 200 meter high wind turbines in this valley, which is absolutely ridiculous. They basically want to, um, at the minute, to evict us from our homes, and that's certainly not going to happen. So after 20 years of learning about planning, learning about the system, learning about how it's all weighted to the developer, um, some of us are coming to the conclusion that really it's only direct action that's going to stop these people because they are determined to destroy every inch of natural habitat. Uh, we have a rewilding program here, which we would far prefer to be working on in our dark sky project rather than having to fight uh, multinational miners because that's what industrial wind turbines and peat bogs means. Uh, and granite, it means blowing up and digging up giant holes. So it's mining by another name. Um, it's absolutely of no value whatsoever, neither to the grid or, or to the local people or anything. And the minute you, the more turbines you have, the more gas they're using, the more fossil fuels. So it's all pie in the sky about the green hydrogen and the blue hydrogen, and it's just non-stop. The planners here in the county and at national level are all development led. Um, I can't think of a single government project that doesn't involve digging. Digging is the big thing. The more JCBs, the better. That's my dog and squeaky there in the background. But um, the, the main thing is perseverance, you know, perseverance and and having your community meetings and getting people out there and getting the signs up. Get your signs up. The minute you hear about any development, get the signs up. They're not welcome because it essentially means removing you from your home, whether it's mining or or indeed like the, the two acres or the two hectares of space that you have in the town. These are vital wildlife corridors here between Glenvey National Park and then the Ardra Moss and all the way down to Sleeve League. Vital wildlife corridors. We've had sea eagles flying over uh, in the last couple of years as well. And then we have a, a multinational come in and stick up an 80 metre mast where golden eagles are flying and uh, claim a, an exemption, a section, what's called a section five exemption here from planning. Um, which is generally for maybe, you know, a garage somewhere or a, or a uh, what would you call it, a skylight or something that you didn't have planning permission for. But they got, they got the exemption from the planning board in Dublin. And now all large scale industrial one developments are go through the planning board in Dublin. No one local has any say how we find out about it, apart from the guys around at night and parking near our houses and stuff. I we found out then was a wet brochure a year later over at the door with our houses circled in red and I asked them where all the turbines would go. Well, these people can forget it because that's not going to happen. And um, the salmon, the Atlantic salmon is of world importance and we really feel we have to protect the river and protect the river we will. Um, yes. Excuse me, I have to give you, to, sorry? excuse me to interrupt you. Can you bring it to a close, please, in two minutes? So yes, we allow yes, no, I'll, I'll, to speak. I'll close there. I'm Thank saying you. that time is so short now. We're seeing the biodiversity crisis. We're seeing 
the climate crisis. It's coming closer and closer to us and time is so short that we have to stop these people. And whether it's going out and stopping someone with a chainsaw and saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Don't cut down that tree. You know, we have to get out there because otherwise they'll just take the ground from under our feet. So uh, thanks very much for letting me uh, tell you something about our, ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it occurred to me that, of course, you're living in a jurisdiction that has uh, an EPA, an independent EPA, for the last 29 years. So, for fear that anybody thinks that we we've, we can sort of legislate our way out of this, it takes, it's going to take a lot more. So, thank you very much. It's very powerful. Um, so, can we can we ask? Yes, sir, Vivian. So this is for Vivian. Hello. Um, yes, so Vivian Grave, also from Queens. Um, most of my work is on Brexit and the environment. So I wanted to talk about another good story when it comes to the environment in Northern Ireland, not just the climate bill, what we have to talk about, uh, but the fact that since the 28th of February, the Office for Environmental Protection that is a new body that's going to replace whatever role the European Commission and Court of Justice had overseeing the environment in Northern Ireland is going to be extended from just England to England and Northern Ireland. Now, this matters a lot because the EPA is about holding private actors accountable for what they do on the environment. The OEP is about holding every public body in Northern Ireland accountable for what they do on the environment. And so if you are not happy with what NIEA does or the city council does, that's where you'll have to take it. Now, it sounds very simple and fantastic. There's a lot of caveats. It's a small team. They are still developing a lot of stuff and you can only take a case there once you've um, exhausted kind of appeal process against the council, appeal process against, you know, so it's not a first step. Right, but it is something new and it's something that they've been actually really open with engaging with stakeholders in Northern Ireland in terms of developing their approach. There's actually a consultation right now that they're running in terms of developing their strategy and developing their enforcement strategy that runs until the 22nd of March. Uh, and I think, I mean, they definitely, they really want to make sure it's not seen as an English body extended to Northern Ireland. So I think they're going to make a lot of effort at taking account, like taking care for Northern Ireland. So now is a really good time to engage with that process, even just put something very small to their consultation to raise the, the awareness. And now that's still quite positive. Now, a bit of the negative thing is that, of course, because it's a small group, uh, it's not going to be a very big body. They are going to have to prioritize. They're not going to pick every case, right? So. That's also something we can feed back on in their enforcement strategy because they've made some choices around, okay, um, they want to, they're going to prioritize things where there's perhaps the most like, environmental impact in terms of the uh, area covered. But they also are going to consider things where they can make the most difference. Now, arguably, yes, of course, England is much bigger, but you'd think, okay, according to the first criteria, they'll mostly do things in England. But if we're considering the state of the environment in Northern Ireland and just holding public bodies to account in Northern Ireland, there the change could be much bigger than in some part of England. So you, I think you, you know, in many ways, with any kind of new public body, I think it's really good to be wary and to not pin all our hopes on them because that's not going to work out. But we should give them a fair shot and really try to engage with it and to make sure that well, that at least, you know, in a few years time, we can be very critical. Hopefully we won't have to be, but for now we should really, and I think they really would benefit from hearing from people. And what they've said as well is that if, even if they're not going to follow every cases, that, you know, they're still going to look at the kind of patterns of what type of um, complaints are made on what type of issues. And so when, you know, you have lots of small complaints on complaints on small issues, gradually they can see patterns of abuse and patterns of where um, you know, organizations in Northern Ireland are not behaving as they should. So even if you don't get the answer to your response, like to your complaint that you want, 
you're still helping them get a better understanding. And because it's a whole new body, they're going to need to build that knowledge. Now, they don't come at it completely from scratch. They've worked with the European Commission to get kind of um, to view and to get all the material for things that have been sent complaint to Europe. Um, they have it. Uh, they may open or not open historical cases. It's up to them. Uh, but yeah, so that's one thing that I think we, that's one thing as well that we will have and the Republic will not. So they'll have the independent EPA, we'll have the independent OEP, and then in a few years time we can compare which one works better as well. Now, from a political science perspective, it's fantastic. From an environmental perspective, that's a bit less. Uh, but, you know, I have to keep things slightly positive. Now, the other project I'm working on right now, and I think that where I'm these fascinating to hear quite similar experience from both Donegal in here in Belfast is um, working on cross-border and all island environment cooperation and all the barriers that we have to working on these uh, levels. And so we just were organizing a workshop with, uh, with NGOs um, and public, um, public bodies today. And one thing that came up so clearly was that most of the interesting stuff when it comes to cooperation is happening on the ground locally, across the border, directly, in county councils, or in, in border region, in uh, citizens-led group or NGOs in the border regions, much more than in Belfast or Dublin. Um, and so I think that's where we have to be, of course, careful. I and mean, as John said, you know, election coming up, right as well. but of course the election is not just here, right? And I think we have to especially groups based in Belfast. And I mean, I know, I mean, I spend my time talking about how Northern Ireland tends to be on the fringe and the periphery, a lot of this discussion when it comes to the EU, when it comes to the UK, even all Ireland. And then I'm based in Belfast and I kind of reproduce that same thing of just being very Belfast centric, when actually a lot of the innovation when it comes to environmental governance and environmental action is taking place outside of the city. Um, so I think that's why it's really fantastic to have this today, where we have both groups that can be here in the room, but also online and keep this, this going, because that's the kind of, we really need to learn from people who are um, outside of the city. Um, I think in general, that's kind of the two big things I wanted to say. Um, if there's any, like, I think I, I will send you the link to the consultation for the OEP so that you can share to any groups I want. Um, and I know that, of course, uh, Neil here, so Northern Ireland and Bound Link, quite a few of the big NGOs will also definitely be putting in uh, putting in responses, but it would be good to have it from so engaged citizens. Everyone can respond to these kind of consultations. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Do we want to uh, give the floor now to Suan or to Oh, Kathy, stop the chat. If you don't want to hold it in your hand close to your mouth, you can put it on your back. Whatever works best. Okay, um, it's lovely to be here. Is that working? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Too loud, right? I don't need a microphone. <laughs> Not too loud. Um, I've got a hanky. I don't have COVID. I recovered from it six weeks ago and I got a cold. So if I start coughing and sneezing, please don't evacuate the room. So um, it's just so lovely to be here. Thank you, Colin, for organising this and whoever else was involved, and Professor Barry as well. The first feeling I got coming into the room, wow, there are clever people surrounding us and putting their arms around us because that's so true, as, as Fiona discovered in her campaign. Very soon into it, like none of us who started our campaign were environmentalists. We just, something happened and we thought, how on earth can this happen? So I just want to really tell you a little bit about our story. I'll try and keep it as simple as possible because the longer it goes on, the more plots and subplots, as you probably, uh, and Guibar as well, but I'll try and keep it simple. I think the question was, how did it start? Well, basically it was Lily Devlin walking her dog one day and some young chaps were putting white marks on trees. Um, what's the main problem? Uh, local government and government intransigence, incompetence and corruption. Um, and how is it going now? Um, well, trees are still there, but we don't know for how much longer. So I could go and sit down now, but I'll, tr I'll try and fill that in. Um, 
our campaign started towards the end of May last year. Um, Lily was out walking her dog. Lily is the local librarian, a little village called Port of Ferry. For those of you who don't know, it's on the edge of the Ards Peninsula, only a small population of two and a half thousand people. And Lily was the local librarian, everybody knew her. She was out walking her dog at the back of her house, which is actually the cons part of the conservation area. Um, it was a public, it's a public parklands that was donated, uh, donated to the people of Port of Ferry back in the, I think it was maybe the early 80s that was donated or mid 70s. And she noticed that, um, you know, a mountain of equipment had arrived, including these huge porta cabins that we later found were really coffins for dead trees. Um, and a, a young chap was putting white marks on the trees and she, she asked him what, what's happening. And it was almost like he was relieved to be able to tell her that these beautiful trees are coming down. There's 13 of them, unlucky for some, and one stump. Um, so Lily was just kind of shocked because, you know, she, she hadn't, she'd already got a letter through the door because she lived her house back so, onto this uh, conservation area. Um, but the, the letter through the door said there was going to be works, but they didn't mention trees coming down. And this is really the beginning of it. She comes home, she goes on the Facebook, she writes a post, puts a picture of the trees on and saying, how come we're going to lose these lovely, some of these trees were like 100, the, big, the oldest trees 150 years old, big lime tree, some of them are 100 years old, some of the younger ones 40, 60 years old. So just how, what do people feel about this? Well, there was an outpouring of kind of anger on her Facebook page, there was over 100 comments put on very quickly. And there was one that I always remember, um, it was her cousin who sadly died during the summer. And he says, you need to stop this, but don't assume somebody else is going to do it. Uh, so Lily got stuck in and she, she got a grip around her. She asked me to become involved. She would be here tonight, except she's on holidays. Um, and we first thing we did was we decided to, well, well she phoned the local uh, councillor who told her that he there was only one tree coming down and he was very surprised. And then he sort of changed his tune and said, you try and do something for local people. And then they start to complain. So then a few things happened and then we decided to start a, a, a camp, you know, a, a campaign, an online, an online petition through change.org. Um, I mean, trees for a car park, because that's what was happening. They were chopping down 13 trees to extend a car park. Um, and of course, first thing that came to mind was Joni Mitchell, you know, in 1970. So we used Joni Mitchell's, we, 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 we you know, you know, pay of paradise to put up a parking lot. Um, before we knew it, you know, not only was this outpouring um, on Facebook, but also then on change.org. It was just we watched the numbers going up. We now have almost 65,000 people have signed that petition because it was just so wrong, you know. And I remember the very first, I mean, she asked me, would you get involved? And I had already been involved in a campaign in the early 2000s to save explorers. And I knew how difficult it is and I thought I didn't really want to get involved you know because I thought I other things I wanted to do I didn't really want to get involved but she says please come down the press are coming just come down and I went down and I stood underneath these huge beautiful trees and I thought hi why? How, how did somebody come to this decision in a conservation area in an area of outstanding natural beauty to chop these down for parking places? So I was in, I mean, we couldn't walk away. So so really, we have just worked to try and um, find out what, what, what was going on. Um, we took a petition. The petition was about 55,000 at the end of June. Uh, we took a petition to the local council, Arts and North Down Borough Council. Um, but meanwhile, a local architect um, who was, again, horrified, decided that he offered his time voluntary to create an alternative environmental option which would incorporate the uh, parking, the trees in the parking places. Now there was a compromise and we were asked to present to the council at the end of June. They said, were you willing to compromise? And we said, yeah, I mean, we're kind of thinking we really don't need more parking places, but you know, if, if it, you know, well, yes, we'll compromise. Um, and he pre presented, we presented his plans at the end of June, which meant we only had to lose three trees. And we were able to incorporate, he incorporated the trees into the parking places. It was, there was about eight or nine less parking places. Um, and that seemed to be welcomed by the council. Um, they decided they would go away and they would look at an environmental alternative. And we thought, great, you know, we're getting somewhere. And so we met them on site in July. And that's when I first started to smell a rat uh, whenever they were going to put forward an alternative option, plan B, but with no costs and telling the councillors it was going to be very high risk because there was no cost. So we all started to smell a rat then. And so they brought their experts in, ACOM, and 
month went past, July went past, August went past, nothing has brought back to council. Uh, we began to think, right, there's not, this is not, they're not really serious about this. And really what they were doing all that time was they were trying to fix their original plan, which had been designed in-house, okay, had been designed in-house. Um, they were using permitted developments without having done an environmental screening. And this is when we needed the help of the clever people, because I hadn't even heard of what an environmental assessment was. Um, the Green Party at that stage were helping us. They put us in touch with Dean Blackwood, who was a member of the gathering. And Dean said, you can't do permitted development if you haven't done an environmental screen. And I said, but it's the council, sure, they must have done it. They, have, they can't break the law. And he says, Kathy, I am telling you now, there's no environmental screening and they have to do it. And I thought, what? So people, so then we started, to, I started to read the legislation, started to, you know, go on this complete learning curve. I'm sure Fiona's been here and Guibara's probably been there as well uh, and discovered, you know, that they had just made this decision because it suited them, because they had applied to get £350,000 funding to build the car park, to put CCTV in, to do a lot of other things there. To cut a long story short, um, we were so frustrated, we wrote to the Department of, the, of Infrastructure, having 65,000 people on your petition is really good because we've kept in regular communication with them. We want letters sent, they get behind us, and there was a lot of letters sent to the Department of Infrastructure. We said we're minded to put TPOs on the trees. Now the council had already given themselves permission in 2019 to chop these trees down. Officers through delegated authority, councillors knew nothing about it. The councillors didn't, they, and they did it under works to trees that the trees were sick or were a danger. They, they weren't. You know, this is something. Uh, and it turns out then they get a letter from the Department of Infrastructure saying. You can't give yourself permission to chop down trees on land in a conservation area that you own because whenever the local councils went to, when planning went to local councils in 2015, laws were introduced to stop conflicts of interest like this happening. So they were told that, they, that the permissions they'd given themselves to chop down the trees were beyond buyers, unlawful. They, 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 they'd given themselves, so they, they had to be scrapped. Um, and the and DFI said, well, we're minded to put um, TPOs on uh, and they sent their tree officer out. And I thought, this is all looking great. Until this, uh, until kind of D-Day, which was the 27th of October, 2021, when they brought their alternatives, you know, their environmental alternative back from ACOM, their specialists. And on the 27th of October, all these councillors, even the DUP back in June and July, but all really enthusiastic about the environmental alternative. Suddenly they were against it. And the director of, an, of, of regeneration um, really talked the councillors round. And it wasn't probably the deal had been done beforehand, but they voted down the environmental option, which saved about nine of the trees. Um, and maybe had, I think it was 13 less parking places. So they, they, they voted for their original scheme because they could get 13 extra parking places from the 13 extra trees. And really from there, that's when we, that's when we kind of thought, what is something wrong in the state of Denmark? You know, there. Um, Northern Ireland, I hope he doesn't mind me saying it, but Northern Ireland has like an Indiana Jones for environmentalists and his name is Gordon Duff and he's sitting here, hope he doesn't mind me mentioning him, but Gordon and a number of other people reached out after that point because everyone thought this is so bad, there's something seriously wrong here. And we began to ask questions. Then all the freedom of information went in and all of that. And what we have is a much bigger scandal, really. What we have is a, a public parklands which is being divvied up. Um, there's a, 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 a profit sharing agreement with the local aquarium. And they have promised the parklands to the local aquarium through that profit sharing agreement. Uh, an earlier extension to the uh, Ex Explorers extension, sorry, happened about at the end of 2019. They gave the aquarium permission to extend and they extended into our parklands. We lost a right of way. We lost lots of trees. Um, but they, they kind of knew from our freedom of, from freedom of information we put in, we discovered there had been a pre-application discussion. They realised that we were going to have to do everything right. We we're going to have to have habitat assessments, environmental screenings, because we're looking at a major development, which they couldn't have got away with. So basically we've discovered a new term called salami slicing or project splitting, and that's really what they're doing. So what we're looking at now is a much bigger problem because we've asked the questions and I think that's really I mean I'll probably skip through a lot but that's really just I, I, I see it two phases pre the 27th of October what we were doing what we thought we were making progress 
One thing you said, Fiona, it really struck with me when you said you can't win, you can't win them over on the basis of the environment. They don't care. My brother's a councillor with Arts North Down Borough Council, and he said to us at the very beginning, he said, you're going to have to shame them. And by God, are we going to shame them? We are continuing to ask all the really hard questions. It's difficult because it has created division within the community because people don't want to lose the £350,000 funding. But, you know, fortune doesn't just favour the brave. It favours the persistent. You have to keep going. And all those things that people were saying about sharing, sharing the, the you know, and, and taking the help of the likes of Gordon. We had freedom of information specialists uh, reached out to us, tendering specialists. People, if they see something that's unjust, they will gather around you and, and that's how it works. It works by collectively working together. So that's why I'm delighted tonight to be among, you know, such sympathetic people and we'll be bending your ear, you know, so once once we get your, your contact details. Thanks very much. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, I think now bye Vivian, thanks for joining us. I think we can give the floor now to somebody online. Um, can you hear us okay? Yes? Yeah, can be fine. Yes, hi. Yes. So, Hello, we, okay, are you happy to talk there? I, yes, I if that's all right. Good. Okay, that's, Thank you, that's, yes. o, that's over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody, um, and hello to Kathy and hello to Gordon, and hello to everybody who I kind of, and we Barra, who I've come across online as well. Uh, I'm in the car coming back from Belfast, um, so that's why I look a bit weird. Um, so I am part of a group of um, called Save Knock Ivy, and we've been doing this campaigning business for nearly five years now. Um, and I just want to echo some of the other comments um, that were made. You know, we started out thinking, oh, there's been a terrible mistake. Someone will fix it and we'll speak to the council and it'll be fine. Um, but that really is not... <laughs> what happens at all. So I have followed events in South Belfast where I spent a considerable part of my youth um, with with interest and 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 I've shared your pain and frustration. Um, and I've I've watched you start down a path that 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 I think many of us have started down in different in different ways. But um so yeah just to tell you a little bit about the campaign for Knock Ivy very briefly. Um, it's Knock Ivy is a hill in South Down where I'm from and it's the location of a Neolithic burial cairn, which is a scheduled monument. Um, this hill was the inauguration place and par seat of um, the Arnish uh, of Akakoba, and then the later McGuinness Lords of Ibe. So it's a very important historical site. It was a place of governance where laws would have been made and the local kings would have married the land goddess in an inauguration ceremony, which is designed to you know, highlight the respect and centrality given to the relationship of the people living in the land to the land itself. So it was it was a marriage of people and land. And I feel that the, the assault on Knock Ivy, albeit by a wind turbine, um, really uh, a wind turbine where there was no consultation with archeologists, um, it sort of hits at the heart of what's going on here. And it's a lost relationship between people and land. And obviously you you all feel it, but um, I'm not sure that uh, every, quite everybody feels it in the same way. So it's kind of up to us to help them remember a little bit about who they are, but that's 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 not easy. So I, I commend you all for for being there, and um, I really do wish you well. I want to say congratulations to the organisers of this event. It's great. I've just come back from speaking as part of a group called the Gathering, um, which is a, a collective of sixty um, plus um, community groups, all of whom are fighting similar battles across the north of Ireland and elsewhere. Um, and we were presenting to, I don't know if you can hear me, can someone just let me know that I'm not just talking to myself? I can hear you. Oh great, okay. Um, no, so we were presenting to the, the Public Accounts Committee today who are having a review of a report published by the Northern Ireland Audit Office into planning in Northern Ireland. Some of you may have seen um, coverage of that report in the press. We actually pushed quite hard for an opportunity to talk to the Public Accounts Committee today to talk about the costs of poor planning, the costs in terms of the environment, um, the failures in terms of environmental impact assessments, um, and and the costs in terms of what it costs a community to be up against a company or developers, or for a neighbour to be up against their neighbour um, with a planning system that's not fit for purpose. Um, and you may see some, there's just been a little bit of press coverage about what was discussed there at Stormont today. Um, 
we were making the same arguments that some of you have been making in terms of um, an independent environmental protection agency being a, an essential part or at least third party rights of appeal being an essential part of the system and we did we didn't mince our words i think it's fair to say about the state of planning here um so you know th there are other you're, you're not alone this this campaign is not alone this idea is not alone and to join up all of these campaigns and i think someone touched on it earlier a lot of us are quite rural so the gathering would maybe have quite a lot of people in derry we're in south down and um, cathy's in port of ferry so we're not we're not in the city but if we do have a lot of um experience now at this business and um it's amazing what can be achieved in quite a short pace of time through pressure and there the pressure is building and the momentum is certainly building and you're going to add to it and i have a feeling that we might hopefully be coming soon to a tipping point so just um just stick at it um and if we all get behind each other i don't think that they can afford to ignore us anymore i think that people have people have uh, awoken up to this relationship they're watching their places being destroyed they're watching disrespect to an environment that they love and whether that's simply the walk that you do every day and those trees that you get to know every day or whether it's a place where people have gone to bury their dead and marry the land for six thousand years it's a relationship that we are trying to save um, and i think we have to wake everybody up to that and i think we could do it really well if we join each other and support each other and i think that's all i wanted to say i'm really delighted to be able to just hop on so thank you very much okay so um it's the time for the save the lagan campaign see you on thank you um my name is Sue Ann Harding and I'm here. I'm also a professor at Queen's University. I'm professor in translation and intercultural studies, um, but I'm here speaking for Save Our Lagan and there's a few people here um, that I've gotten to know over the past few weeks. Um, I also am an accident, purely accidental activist and this all started around the 13 trees that were cut down um, in front of the apartments when uh, Molly Rose brought that to our attention through um, the next door app and the shock of the fact that those trees were decimated is still something that um, kind of um, yeah is something I think about every day so that's how I started because I just thought that is absolutely appalling and was shocked that it could even happen and so we had a little gathering and we met people i met colin i met others colin was running um community uh, meetings over on Ormo road and i thought well we'll go my husband came a lot we'd we'd go just to find out um and so quickly learning i didn't even know that there was a tidal alle flood alleviation thing i had i was clueless i had no idea i had and i just didn't know any of these things and it's the minute you start asking and looking and reading then you just find out that there's so much going on and i think that that's the main that is one of the big problems because you have to quickly bring yourself up to speed you have to figure out what's going on you have to know who to write to who to talk to what to do um, and that's quite overwhelming when you've got um, a job and and children and other things like that so I I think um, our well we we actually did um, di some direct action down where because there were four more trees coming down and we made a fuss about that and we put up our banners and we went down and on the first day we stood next to <clears throat> the diggers and then they went away and on the last day well that we were there all week so we got into the media and we had politicians speaking to us and and i think that was effective because it raised people's um awareness people were tooting their horns and speaking to us as they were going to work as greg here was one of those people um and i think that was good because i i feel like we kind of Rat rattled cages as Claire Hannah said um, but the trees came down on the day before the bird nesting thing they went in at six o'clock in the morning because they knew that we were turning up at around eight we ran down at ten past seven half past seven it was too late we um, 
went and stood next to the chainsaws and we bothered them and we hustled them. But if, and they were saying, why? It, it's too late. The trees are down. And I'm like, I'm making a point. <laughs> um, and I felt that that direct action, like I've never done that anything in my life. I've made three banners that week and I'd never made a banner in my whole life. Um, but there was something about that direct action um, about that particular place at that particular time where I just felt it was important that we go and kind of physically stand next to that machinery. Um, and I, I yeah, so. Fair play to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so how's it going? The I think, yes, there's hopefully some momentum and we can continue that. And I'm absolutely thrilled to see other people here in the room and to hear, hear your stories and the way I think the stories echo each other. And there's a real amplification in the way that we tell our stories. And then we hear other people's stories and we see that actually we're all um, telling the same story with many voices um, in, in many different places. So the problems of opacity from the planning people and trying to get past their language, you know, oh, we just have to take down vegetation. No, we have to fell a row of 13 year old, 100 um, year old trees. The opacity and trying to figure out what to do next, how to, how to keep up. Um, but I, yeah, how to maintain our rage, but also rest. I think that was also really important because that action week was absolutely exhausting and I have a friend in Melbourne who has been campaigning um, about the refugees who are locked up there in the hotel and she's been doing it for like a year and I was like my god do I have to stand on this street corner for the next year <laughs> um, so I'm really encouraged to hear everybody um, and I think our strength is that we are a motley crew that we are not necessarily all of one voice but that we come from different backgrounds and different perspectives, but it's that relationship between um, the, the environment and ourselves that is being broken. And I think if we can amplify that more, and because there are many people who are with us, um, those 65,000 that you have on your, on your petition, for example. So that's Save Our Lagoon. Thank you. So I, I don't know, are there other groups? attending the meeting at this stage or should we go to Amanda? Uh, yeah, other groups were Russ Trevor uh, I, that I was in contact with, but they couldn't commit for obvious reasons. Um, uh, I, can't remember. I think it was on the flyer, but um, I think we'll work. Yes, it's at Maraf Park. I think it would work. Oh, God. oh, sorry, lagging trust. I say it. Of course, so you can speak. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Fantastic. Sorry, that was. I was too shy to ask you. We have one more uh, uh, before. Is that okay, Amanda? You're really trying your patience. No, absolutely. I'm loving okay. him. Okay, this is a very important voice here. This is a man who's actually got a, a real dog in the fight. It's um, uh, uh, Gary. Yeah, from uh, Lagan River Trust. Uh, I can try, but maybe you can start. What, what about that? You, you could, you could, you could on your, just you put unless it on. you want to. No, you stick it on there. there we go. Yeah, Gary Houston. Um, so I, Houston, H O E S T O N. So I represent the Lagan Rivers Trust. Um. It's under, if you find the presentation, it's under CFR Lagan. <laughs> um, yeah, represent the Lagan Rivers Trust. So we're a limited company, a charity, uh, and we're going from 2012. We were set up by, initially set up and funded by NIA, and our focus is in water quality. So we'll cover the Lagan catchment, uh, and as far out as Bangor, and as far up as Whitehead, and 10 miles out to sea. So. It's really a, a community based organization to try and improve water quality. So I see. So limited company, limited charity, that's who we are. Try to work with community groups. We do lots of things like we um, look at the invertebrates in the river. So we work with uh, we train volunteers to go in 
and check the water quality by checking the insects in the river from Grimara right down into Belfast or lower sites Red Bridge. Uh, um, sometimes you'll find that the, the invertebrates are better at Red Bridge than they are in Grimore, for instance, because of agri stuff and things. So very interesting that we use them as the arrays of the river. We own a woodland, we work with the Woodland Trust. So we took on the woodland in Seymour Hill, which is about a 1.5 kilometer woodland and um, runs along the river. We have put new paths in it, it's open to the community. And um, that's the local MLA. Um, Got to work with Phoenix Natural Gas or to put in new benches and things. But we saved 400 trees there this year alone. Um, Northern Ireland Networks were looking to um, do a swathe cut around a power line there and said we have to cut down 400 of quite big trees and we just said no you're not doing it show us your policy <laughs> just said no point blank no and they're going but you have to we, we'll come and do this anyway whether you like it or not i said you're not doing it well stop you're not doing it we're not permitting you and they eventually come back and said oh we, we've re reprioritized this so now we're not doing it so that's a very recent win on trees <laughs> Um, this is a wee map, this is the NIA map of barriers in the lagging. So now I'm talking about weirs and things and things that stop um, fish and things moving up and down the river. This is for lampreys, a protected species. So the red dots are barriers that are impassable. Um, this is an assessment, the continuity assessment. So how things can move up and down the river. And basically um, they're saying that a lot of these structures and even the fish passes put in aren't possible. Stromellus, so close to save our lagging. Stromellus is an absolute nightmare. Um, DFA, Belfast City Council, absolute nightmares. I and mean, ACOM especially, nobody, nobody cares less about the environment. 6.8 million. We made EU complaints, which have been thrown back because we're obviously now out of Europe. Europe doesn't care less, only about protocol and trade issues. Those have all been thrown back. They spent 6.8 million. This is the rotten fish past the side. The deer inland fisheries modified this incorrectly, but if it, an eel pass in, it doesn't work. It doesn't comply with the eels directive. Um, the lamprey obviously can't pass it and they replaced that whole structure there to put a but a, a lock in, um, which is another story, you know, with the, the canal, which is one of the most ecologically disastrous projects that Northern Ireland will ever face, you know, and we, we fight against that. So, our next, we will be going to the OEP with that one. Um, yeah, we we'll go on. So, yeah, we have a big problem with, with there and that fish pass needs replaced. You know, it shouldn't, all that work should have incorporated. It was originally to incorporate a proper fish pass, but of course it was too much money. Took the least cost option, replaced that weir, supposed to be replaced with a present shape weir. They're the least cost option, cheapest option, and we're left with something that doesn't, doesn't work. But still needs fixed. There's other pass, there's other of these level gates. There's this one at Hilden. Again, the, the river's dewatered. The water's taken out of the river completely, brought downstream, put back in. There's a salmon pass just here. There's no tracks in the flow. Salmon would never come up to find it. It's just an absolute disaster. Nobody wants to do anything about it. Not inland fisheries, not DFA, nobody. And this is a DFA level gate. It's actually built on the Lagan Rivers Trust leased land and they won't even open the gates to let to let species pass. We have to fight them when salmon do eventually get stuck in a flood. We have to fight them to get the gate lifted. And this is this is scheduled for replacement as well, the same as Tramilla. So this is going to be another three, four million pound project. And it's not needed. It's not used for flood control. It shouldn't be there. It should be removed. Okay. Um, this one's at Lambeg, same issue. This wee thing over here is the salmon pass, but all the flows over here. So the salmon come upstream in the head here and they just get stuck. And there's no pass for lampreys or anything. 
We do work with the NIA. One of the projects we're doing at the moment is uh, working with Seabeck Eco Engineering, and we're actually taking these weirs out. This is one for the Colin Glen, on a project that has just finished. I think we're in our fifth year trying to get this one done. So it's extremely complicated. Nobody wants to work with you. You know, everybody lives in their wee silos. The NIA, DERA, DFI. You have to go to each one of them to get permission to do something like this. It takes years and years and years and things like the challenge fund. This would be through three challenge funds and it's still not finished. You know, so we're replacing the weir with a, a naturalized rock ramp. So these are very complicated projects to get off the ground. Um, the trust also um, managed to lease the estate, the old Wallace estate um, from the owner. Um, which is about 66,000 acres, and we leased the rights as to try and get to try and get some sort of foot in the door with agencies to stop people doing and wrecking the rivers and wrecking everything about the lagging that they just want to destroy it. Like, so we actually leased from Loch Ney right across most of the lagging canal, most of the lagging down to Lady Dixon, and every the bed of every water course in that 66,000 acres on water rights. Places like places like Broadwater and Moria, I don't know if anybody you know, know it, it's a bit of the old canal. Um, we basically lease it from the state. Um, we have provided the era with the, the title of the state, which has been in, been in the, the the court registered maps. My state has been there from the 1860s, I think. But they say because it's in the public angling state, they've no idea how it got into the public angling state. It's ours. So we have engaged Phoenix Law to try and bring the matter to close because they're they're blocking the car parks, they're blocking our access from the car parks, they're blocking us appointing private water bills for the whole of lag and catchment. So we're trying to bring that matter to close. So and that's DFI is involved in that as well because they say they own the whole path again, which they don't. So you have one agency, they are in on fisheries claiming the fishing rights, which they don't own, and have no idea how they got them. And you have DFI claiming towpath and car parks, which they've no title to either. So quite a wee bit of a land steal. Thank you, folks. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, your uh, presentation, your overview. Now it's uh, the time of uh, our respondents, uh, Amanda and John Barry later. Thank you. Thanks very much, Teresa. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Amanda, we can hear you. You can go ahead. We can let Claire speak later. Is that OK? Yeah. OK, great. Thanks very much uh, for inviting me to uh, participate in today's event. Um, it's been really amazing to hear all your stories and to, to really reflect on what's happening across Northern Ireland, particularly today after uh, a very momentous occasion yesterday. Uh, John mentioned at the start of today's event that yesterday we saw the introduction, uh, the passing of Northern Ireland's first climate change bill um, as the outcome of over two years of very hard work of, by some of us in the climate coalition in Northern Ireland. So I want to reflect on some of our successes um, through climate coalition Northern Ireland, which I chair, um, and also some um, of more critical and challenging experiences from campaigns I've been involved in the past. Some of you will be aware that um, I was involved in the Shell to Sea campaign, which was uh, in response to the imposition of a large scale gas processing plant in Northwest Mayo. 
so both in all my experiences over 25 years of campaigning, um, I, I want to take those experiences and reflect uh, on, on some of the things that I've heard tonight. I suppose the first point is, is to make that it's been really amazing to hear your stories and your shared learning of how you and many others are standing up against developments that damage our environment. Um, it's both awe-inspiring and, and just so powerful to hear uh, and to learn more about what's happening. A few of you have said and reiterated tonight that it is essential we share our experiences, not only for the valuable learning that comes with that, but also because of the support and the solidarity and the important advice and guidance we get from each other when we do have these conversations and when we collaborate. Um, a common theme that I heard from, from everybody speaking tonight was a sense of being forced to take action. I want to use the term an accidental environmentalist. Uh, and I think that's the case for many of us, indeed for myself. Uh, I, I became an accidental environment, environmentalist uh, about 17, 18 years ago um, when I heard about, about five men being jailed for protesting against a gas project. Um, and I think when we, when we become environment, <laughs> accidental environmentalists and, and we learn and we get into our campaigns, um, there are challenges that poses. There are interpersonal challenges, there are personal challenges, there are collective challenges that, that come with being forced to be an activist. But on the flip side, our awakening, our imagination of how we live our lives and interact in our communities with our environment is, is empowering. It, it develops our passion and drive uh, to make our world a better place. Um, and, and from that strength that we get from becoming active in these campaigns, you know, we also develop allies, uh, which is really important. Uh, key strength in the Chelsea campaign was the development of allies across the island of Ireland, uh, but also internationally as well. Uh, I have no doubt that a large success of our Working Climate Coalition in Northern Ireland has been through our development as Northern Ireland's largest civil society network by developing allies, by making allies, by working together. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Climate Coalition Northern Ireland, um, we are a civil society group that encompasses um, environmental NGOs, academics, students groups, youth climate strikers, we have some farmer groups uh, and some other uh, environmental groups as well. And we came together with the explicit aim of, of striving for climate legislation for Northern Ireland. Uh, we formed in January 2020 I became chairperson in July 2020 on the day that uh, Minister Evan Puth said it wasn't, wasn't possible to introduce urgent climate legislation in three months, despite the Assembly voting for urgent climate legislation. And, and that challenge um, from and the political transients I heard others refer to tonight was a, a kicking point for us to say, well, actually, we need climate legislation. The, the evidence is irrefutable. We are living in a climate and biological emergency. We have to do that. The lack of climate legislation in Northern Ireland has hampered and indeed stopped the effective climate mitigation adaptation actions that we need. And so we began working with uh, independent legal experts and cross-party, cross-community MLAs to look at developing um, Northern Ireland's first climate bill. And I'm delighted that Claire Bailey is with you today. I'm so sorry I can't be in the room today with you all. Um, because Claire has been amazing uh, and ultimately became the lead sponsor of the first climate bill that originated from civil society. So the success of us coming together in, in Climate Coalition Northern Ireland, our successes in bringing together cross-party, cross-community MLAs uh, to collaborate on climate legislation has been an immense success, uh, which has culminated after a long period uh, in, in yesterday's first um, climate change bill being passed by the Assembly. So at points of allies, uh, sharing learning, developing strong relationships has all been really key. It's been really key in the success of Climate Coalition Northern Ireland, the success of the climate change bill. It's also been key in, in, in other really strong campaigns that may not have had the successes that we had hoped for. For example, the, the carb gas project was forced upon community in Mayo, but the community successes enabled the reduction of gas pressure, the relocation of the processing terminal, the limitations of, of pollution uh, in the area. So there were some small wins there as well. And ultimately those wins came from building relationships, developing allies, getting involved, um, sharing knowledge, uh, developing different strands of expertise, and also recognising our limitations. 
when we don't have expertise and, and stuff like areas, being able to reach out to others who do have those expertise. And I really liked um, Kathy's points uh, on the sharing of expertise. Uh, and I think Anne referred to that as well. That's been a, a really key part for us in in our work around the climate legislation is, yeah, within our coalition, we had we have an awful lot of expertise, uh, but we don't have legal expertise. So working with legal experts had, has been really important. We don't have the expertise that Claire and other MLAs have of being in the system, of being part of the process to, to legislate and, and to provide the macro level frameworks for environmental and climate action. So to work with MLAs was really important as well. Um, and some other, I suppose, concluding thoughts just based on what I've heard, um, and, and then maybe we can have a bit more of a discussion. Um, because I, I'm so conscious that over the last two years of our working climate coalition, there's so much to share that I don't want to <laughs> necessarily uh, bombard everybody with information. But I suppose just a few concluding thoughts to contribute to the conversation um, was around, again, the, the piece of, of sharing, learning, uh, collaborating, reaching out to others, but also taking time to strategize and reflect. Um, I heard some of you talk about the overwhelming sense of needing to act in campaigns. I've been there so many times, so many campaigns. We just feel compelled to take action. But the downside of that is sometimes we're, we're so busy taking action that we don't have time to reflect and think about what's the bigger uh, goals of the campaign. So in the coalition, we have been very careful to take time to, to reflect as far as we can. But also on a personal level, you know, I've also experienced burnout because I didn't take the time to look after myself. Um, and I think some of you have talked about the risk of burnout, and it's really important that we take care of ourselves too. I say that on the flip side of recovering from burnout, that self-care is really important. We can't look after our communities or our environment or our climate if we're not looking after ourselves. So on that point of, of self-care, reflection, of strategizing, uh, and, and, and open up the conversation better, because I think, you know, today just recognizing the momentous occasion yesterday of Northern Ireland passing its first climate bill. You know, people power works. When we campaign, we have real change. And it's it's amazing to hear what you're all doing. And I look forward to, to talking about and, and collaborating with you all further because this is what has to happen. We can only make our world a better place if we all come together and bring about change. So that's my initial thoughts. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Thank you for all your uh, suggestion and advice and yeah, your thoughts and congratulations again. So, uh, Claire, would you like to come uh, here? <laughs> it's great to have you. Thank you very much and thank you for hosting it. And, and thanks for the, the invite to be here in person as well for getting one of the lucky tickets. I feel like Charlie Turning the chocolate factory, so I'll just hold it. But listen, guys, I'm really, really open. I'm more than happy. If you have something that you want me to maybe focus in on, please do ask me to do that because the state of the environment in Northern Ireland is beyond shameful. And the guardianship of it is beyond shameful. And I get lost in even trying to know where to begin. Um, so I was privileged enough to be elected in 2016 um, for South Belfast here. When I first went to the assembly, I was on the Justice Committee, um, just trying to find my feet, trying to learn what it was to be an MA, MLA, and then sure they all fell out again, and we were out of a job. Three years, three years of this mandate, we had to be put on constituency office duties, not knowing what the assembly was, not knowing what it was to be on a committee, not knowing what the access to this institution would be. Uh, by the time they got themselves back together again in January 2020, under the new decade, new approach deal, that deal said that we would have a, an, a climate act for Northern Ireland, and that deal said that we would have an independent environment protection agency. And the executive formed themselves in January, COVID hit eight weeks later, we're all back out working from home. Oh man, you know, trying to reinvent the game what that was. But this time I was on the ERA committee. Okay, and everybody says, you're a green, don't go on the ERA. That's just so stereotypical. That's what they're going to, my God, my eyes have been opened. Like I thought that I knew, I knew nothing. And that's the reality of it. We have a serious air pollution problem in Northern Ireland. We know 
the department's own figures and st statistics and data shows them that up to five to six hundred premature deaths are caused in Northern Ireland every single year, directly attributable to our air pollution. Last year, the report on our waterways, you will know more than most, 98% of our waterways failed to meet even basic good standards. This year, 100% failed to meet even basic good standards. We have ammonia levels in our areas of special conservation and special scientific uh, interest, breaching EU legal directive limits by up to 400% every single year and nothing's done. They know and nothing's done. I've put reports together. I've sent them to the EU enforcement teams. EU enforcement scratched their head and interesting case, especially in the light of protocol and the Brexit. Uh, but no, we're not going to do anything because Ireland doesn't impact on Europe so much. And that was the response. So we can't get the enforcers to come and enforce. We have a, a dysfunctional um, system. I'm not saying even just executive. The whole institution is completely dysfunctional in the, the way that it works in silo. So they don't have to work together. So when you're hearing yourselves coming together at these local community levels to share experience, to share knowledge, to learn from each other, to work together, that is not our institutional way of working and they don't know how to do it. Nor does the uh, Stormont work with councils. That's not to say that there's not good people in there, because there absolutely are so many good people in there, but they just can't. The engines and the processes are setting us up to fail. OK, um, and back in 2020, when the executive was resumed, we got Edwin Poots for our era minister. OK. <laughs> Did you know that Edwin Poots is now your South Belfast rent representative? OK, OK. So ask him about this. So he did one of the first motions that was passed on the assembly floor when we went back in January 2020 was the call to declare a climate emergency and it passed. It passed with the majority. I think it was just the DUP and the TUV who wouldn't be having that. The minister replied to that response on the floor and said, I'll not be using that language. I find it very unhelpful. Oh my God, tell you what I find very unhelpful is the crisis that's coming and the impact of it. Anyway, we got to June, another motion come forward asking him to bring forward that climate bill within 100 days, as was promised under the NDNA agreement. He says, I'll not be rushed. I'll bring it in my own good time. Basically, and the time frame was ridiculous and impossible and sit down and don't be stupid basically to the rest of the assembly. So it was on that 100th day chatting to John Barry, Amanda, that you've just heard from the Climate Coalition. Everybody was listening to that. And on the 100th day, that climate bill was handed into the Speaker's office. And it took a few months to go through the system and it was not just uh, the processes don't allow everybody to be acknowledged on it. So I'm called the sponsor of the bill and my name was on it. But Sinn Féin signed up, the SDLP signed up, the UUP signed up, the Alliance Party signed up, People Before Profit signed up, Claire Sugden and Trevor Lunn as independents had also signed up to that bill. The only people that didn't sign up was the DUV and the DUP. OK, and yesterday what happened, so it was about six months later, the minister then did come forward, he was catching up, catching up, brought his own bill. Then he takes president, gets to a certain place because he's an executive minister and I'm a backbencher and it's a private member's bill versus a minister's bill. His takes over. That was OK. You know, what we wanted was a bill and we were challenging him. So we'd set net zero, we'd set ambitious targets, independent oversight, just transition principles, all these lovely things in there. We couldn't get the citizens assembly, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> so it's only first steps. Um, and yesterday what happened was it was the minister's bill as eventually on the same day. So he was tabled yesterday morning to finish final stage and I was in the afternoon for consent consideration stage, just keeping him going, making sure that he passes final stage. But, you know, anyway, it, it's it's passed. It's not the bill that I would want. It's no political party's bill, but I think it's one of the most democratic pieces of legislation that that institution's ever seen coming um, because it was worked from the floor. It was driven by civic society. It had the backing of campaigners such as yourselves. Everybody had a stake in that one. And what we have resulted in is still a decent piece of good climate legislation, but legislation's only the start. It's not the end, OK? And there's other things that we're missing that we haven't got delivered yet either. Uh, and 
the the crisis that we're in and the governance system that we have and the dire situation of responsibility and accountability and transparency that we just don't have really will only come about when everybody works together okay don't let them in the big house i do this because storm it's way up on the hill with the man with the big finger shook down at you you know but don't let this be the boss we are elected into that building, into that institution, into that privileged public office to represent you. And it's not one where 90 MLAs and one can't do it all. I promise you they can't. I wish that I could take on all the environmental campaigns that come my way. I can't. I'm going to be here crying some nights. I lost teeth over that climate bill. Just broken because there's so much to do. OK, but it has to come from people led because where we are is on a tipping point. And we can't move forward relying on the very things that made the problem and the crisis that we're facing come up with the solutions. It has to be driven by a collective effort and people have to be at the front of it. So if there's anything that I could say tonight is this is the democracy of the future that's absolutely needed on a local level, on a governance level and on an accountability level because everything's changing and very, very soon. And thank you for being amazing. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, really great. John, do you want to come up and say something? I, and I'm also conscious of the time, and I don't know whether people want to ask questions or want to uh, propose issues for discussion or for another event. I promise, I promise to be really, really quick because I do think it's time for us to have a discussion. But as I said at the start, I mean, hopefully this is the first of something new. We don't, we're not going to solve everything in, in one meeting. Uh, and certainly for me, just reflecting on the presentations and what has been said, it's an issue that's come out um, in all the, the talk is the importance of networking and building uh, a movement of movements, as it were. And I'd like to propose that um, if people want to have a think about this, we don't have to discuss and decide it now. But well, I'm more than happy to put the resource at the university at the disposal of such a network. Rooms, uh, there's, as I said before, we've got lots of really clever people from ecologists to planners and so on. Why don't we start inviting them in? There are already existing networks. We've got Northern Ireland Environment Link. They should be here. So it's that issue. Who else should be here? So there's one Northern Ireland Environment Link. You've got. Uh, OK, so you've got the gathering that's already been mentioned as another. Another one that's been established um, in the last year or so is Environmental Justice Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, and there are probably others as well that we could think of. So I do think it's about who else is in the room here. And I actually think that there's probably more people concerned about the environment, but not linking up with others. You know, you've got the anti uh, um, fracking people in the border counties. You've got the anti Dalridian gold mine. There's so many other groups that I think would benefit from coming together. So for me, I do think that mutual learning that Amanda said, mutual help. Uh, and I want to end by um, asking you to demand the universities in particular to do more on this. I'll come back to, to that in, in, in the end. And I think you should describe yourselves as place protectors. I think it's a very evocative phrase. It's not mine. Uh, it's actually, I think, James Orr's and Friends of the Earth have come up with this. But I think that's a really simple way to communicate what we're doing for protect, protecting the place. And that's our way of protecting the planet. And protecting the future and so on. You've got to dig where you stand. Um, you know, that, that's the issue. Many, many of you, it's out of a, a sense of concern and love and rage. They happen to be the, the motto of Extinction Rebellion, love and rage. You know, that sense of concern for a place, but so angry. And that's another thing that's come out of the palpable failure of the organizations that are there to protect us. The first goal of, of, of any state institution is to protect. And it's falling down badly. You know, we just heard from Claire that it's not just the environmental impact, of, in, in other words, the impact on ecosystems and other living creatures, but on human health that's been damaged and the air pollution and ammonia uh, and so on. I do think it's important as well. And again, this takes time and effort. And again, I want to come back to, to ways in which we can. I would love to see phalanxes of students helping you. I teach environmental green politics. But um, poor Claire is a former student of mine and it's mostly head stuff. I think it's good stuff, but actually I would welcome the opportunity to be able to tell my students, listen, here's a menu of environmental struggles happening. 
we are discussing it in theory and the academic side, you can go get your hands dirty in, in doing this. So I think that's something that we could uh, develop together. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus drive? I do think where are the churches in this conversation? Um, and I speak now as a completely collapsed Catholic, but I do believe that people of faith have a role to play. Where you know this is Christian stewardship; it's supposed to be God's creation. Now, why are the church is not outraged uh, around this? Trade unions, sporting groups, the Orange Order, the GAA. I think we shouldn't be discriminatory in terms of all those organisations. Asking them, where are they on this issue? Because there's something around protecting the environment, which should. Of course, this being Northern Ireland, it often doesn't, but there is a greater chance of cross community, cross party support on something like protecting water quality than there is on, on other issues. And um, particularly when it comes to an election to make that point of people looking, on, looking for your vote on the doorstep. In terms of tactics, it has to be a combination of things like engaging with the planning system, but the planning system is permissive of development. It's a pro development legal framework. That's why it's really difficult to challenge unless you've got deep pockets and are willing to go all the way to a judicial review. And that's way outside the capacity of most local community uh, groups. But I do think the planning system needs to be engaged with, even though it's not fit for purpose. And I'm somebody that actually chaired the planning committee of Ards and North Down back in the day. And I can tell you, in my view, it was a disaster for planning to be devolved to the local council because councillors haven't a baldy clue they're shit scared of the planners who talk about costs and talk about reputational damage and legal costs for the council. And so there's something that you, you've probably seen this when you engage with councillors who sit on the planning committee, with the exception that there are people like Councillor Grugan in the Green Party who knows her onions on this stuff. But sadly, that is not the case with most councillors who sit on the planning committee. They're simply sitting there like nodding dogs. The officers say this. And away it goes. You know, we had an example there when Susie it was probably the head of regeneration. Oh my God, it's going to cost so much to have this, you know, environmentally friendly development. And the councillors who often don't have the time and particularly don't have the competence. There's there is no requirement to sit on the planning committee to have any competence or planning, even basic rudimentary uh, uh, degree. Which to me, is, is crazy given that planning has such an impact on, on all our lives. Anyway, that's sorry, a bit of a bit of a, um, a segue there. So I think the, engaging with the planning system, certainly getting legal advice, and we've had examples of them getting that cost, if you get Phoenix Law and so on. But we have environmental lawyers in this university, as well as planners, as well as ecologists, uh, and so on. It's about seeing that what's on our doorstep that we can use for free or for maybe a few pints as opposed to thousands uh, of pounds. I'm not asking for points, by the way, this is all free tonight. I do think a, a common issue in, in, in campaigns is the media and a willingness to use direct action. I'll be honest with you, the system is broke. The system is broke. It is not going to deliver even close to what's needed in terms of environmental protection. It's going to have to be dragged kicking and screaming. But that doesn't mean to say we can't use the formal system, but we have to say it's like a pincer movement. We need the lawful and the unlawful taking direct action. And that's not everybody's gig. You know, it's not for everybody to, to do direct action, lock yourself onto a tree or to set up an encampment on a site that's going to be set for fracking. But my own view, it's a bit like, you know, that phrase you see up the Falls Road in the murals from Frederick Douglass, who's the freed, uh, he's a freed American um, a slave. Power concedes nothing without a struggle. It never has and it never will. And that's why for many of you, perhaps you've had this, where you, you, you're kind of awake now in a way that you weren't before. I'm not saying you're woke, I'm not saying you're awake. And that you realize, because most people think the system is okay. Yeah, it's a bit shitty, politicians aren't great, but more or less there's a system there that's competent, that in general is doing good. When actually when you pull back the screen and you begin to see the shit show that it is, the incompetence, the outright lying, lying, the arrogance of unelected officials. At least politicians have to feel the heat of constituents every so often, not so for unelected uh, officials. They are the ones that you should really be going for. Obviously, speak to your local MLAs, your councillors, but you want to really get to the people in council or government who are making the decision. And that includes SPADs. 
the special advisors who have an inordinate amount of power as the uh, renewable heat incentive uh, scandal showed us. So I think it's a, it's a willingness and to see is it a division of labour between direct action, making links with Fridays for the Future, the young striking people striking for action, Extinction Rebellion, is to see there are other allies out there. And I think that the current state of our environment is so bad because people are so divided in terms of not linking up. So I think we'll go back to that issue of the importance of linking up. And just to end then with an appeal, uh, I've given you an offer of certainly myself, Teresa, Amanda, I'm sorry, I forget your name. Sue Ann. Sue Ann, who's also a fellow back, nice to meet you. She's great, best way of meeting colleagues is uh, in, in a protest meeting as opposed. Um, and, and who? And Vivian. And Vivian, of course, sorry. Um, that there are academics who give a shit. Uh, this is a public institution that has a civic duty I think to provide its knowledge and resources to help in campaigns like this. I'm not speaking on behalf of the vice chancellor, but I don't give a monkeys. I am so angry at the failure of people who should know better in the academy. Who would rather spend their time writing articles rather than saying yes, articles, teaching and. Civic action, particularly if they've got children or they're concerned about the future. Because this university has now made a commitment in its corporate strategy to embrace the sustainable development goals. A lot of it's bullshit, like a lot of organizations, it's corporate speak, but nevertheless, you can use it as a as a wedge. So I could imagine, and I'd be happy to help you shape it, a, a letter in the local press calling out the university. Where are we on the ammonia issue? Why are we spending more of public money researching, you know, profitable patentable technological innovations which are not going to be socially useful. Meanwhile, the environment is going around uh, being destroyed. So I do think uh, there are a number of us within the academy that are willing to invite groups in like you to come out and, and help as best we can. But there is something that here we are, a publicly funded institution. How are we helping you? The university is more comfortable helping corporations and business and policymakers and politicians, elite level stuff. We need to include the community uh, in this. So for me, I just want to end by commending Colin and Breeze and others who helped organize this. Hopefully this is a start of something different, of bringing together as many groups as we can think of, uh, linking ourselves up. Having, I think face-to-face -face meetings are often very good. Yes, online, obviously brilliant. And to see what are the tactics that can be learned uh, from each campaign, but as I say, particularly to see how can we extract more people like me and my colleagues to come and help you, because it's not a lot of time. As I said, we're, lots of people are experts, you just need to give a bit of time uh, on this issue, but I do think it, you have to call out the responsibility of those with power. Knowledge is power, so arm yourself. Thank you. Thank you, John. Do you want to come? Uh, uh, there's time now for a bit of a discussion. I don't know whether you want to come o over. Yeah, so that they can see you on the camera. Uh, can you say your name? And yeah. Okay. Well, um, my name is Gordon Duff. Um, so this has been really, really uh, good to hear everybody, what they're involved in. It's so important to see the depths and the breadth of what's going on and people willing just to stand up and fight their little corner. And it's spontaneous and it's happening everywhere. So everything is coming perhaps towards the tipping point, but everything's making a difference. What, what, it, what I would like to say is there's something else that hasn't really been mentioned very much, and that is the courts. Um, I've taken a number of judicial reviews and it's, it's actually really easy. I used to be a window cleaner, and if I can do it, anybody else can do it. So we have the Our House Convention, and we have Our House Protection. Maximum cost against me if I lose is five thousand pounds. Uh, it cost me two hundred and sixty-one quid for the judicial review. That makes it really, really cheap. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, so. The authorities to defend against that have to bring in their QCs, their, their top legal firms. It cost them a fortune. Andrew Jackson from Dublin came up to the, the uh, launch of ETNI and he said, inundate the courts. 
we need to see that the court is a, I regard the court as a top predator in an ecosystem. We, we need them, they're the wolf. Yes, he can, <laughs> but they are, they are. And the thing about it is the authorities are not scared of a, an awful lot of things where they can just fudge the issue, where they can, they can, they can actually, uh, they can actually use the same old tactics that they've used for many years, but they are very, very scared if they realize they're going to be dragged in the courts. Now, the reason for that is nearly every campaign we've heard about, Include something that's unlawful. It's not just it's not just bad for the environment. Yes, it is. It's not just against policy, but it's actually unlawful. And if you can if you can spot what that is, the unlawful thing, and take it to the court, they are very very scared. And I look at the unlawfulness as like looking at something. We're looking for the cracks. That's not that's not try and uh, necessarily be a blunt instrument. Let's be a sharp. And some of the occasion and go for the cracks because they're very, very scared. What I've noticed is whenever I start to take some judicial reviews in an area, uh, say Lisburn Council, I've a lot against Lisburn Council, they actually start to change what they do. It's not just what I challenge, it's the things that I don't challenge. The decisions either stop altogether for a while, uh, the planning decisions, or they make different ones, um, or, or they can say. So the thing about it is, um, I, I'm not particularly good at this. I'm just willing to do it. And I have got loads of friends. And what I have discovered is when I take a judicial review, there's people who hate me. But there's a lot of people who love me and they're coming and offering me the expertise. Like a network, when, once you act, if you step out bravely and act, a network of civic society, mainstream people, people who wouldn't even thought of getting involved, people who are actually consultants working for the authorities offer to help me privately. So the thing about it is stepping out bravely, start something. You've all stepped out bravely. Like look at the momentum that has started. Um, that there, uh, you've, it, 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 it's all cumulative. It's all slowly taking something to a point and other people therefore can take it a wee bit further. But uh, without, Without support and at a grassroots level, without things being brought to head, those cracks wouldn't be appearing. I got involved in Port of Ferry. The cracks were starting to appear everywhere. It was dead easy. You walk in and they're in meltdown. But uh, so keep doing what you're doing. But uh, other people consider the digital view is a good option. You don't need a legal firm. Just stand up and do it yourself. If anybody wants a hand, to know how to do the paperwork. I'll do the paperwork for you and just stand up and do it. Great. Uh, <clears throat> I, I sign up for <laughs> advice. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kathy. Just so that we include them. He's being very modest, and I, when I called him Indiana Jones, I didn't go on to explain. I mean, he recently had, um, he was in court with regards to unlawful planning applications um, with Lisburn City Council. Yeah, uh, yeah, all, yeah, because Gordon's thing is about, you know, protecting the integrity of the rural countryside. So 18 Lisburn City Council had to quash, had to apply to quash, all right? 18, you know, and as a result of him putting in what I now know was a pre-application, a PAP letter, we, we've had so many sent off to Arts North Down Borough Council. Now they're really frightened. They're frightened because they know that, you know, Gordon is a, he's a sharp shooter. He, he, he kind of doesn't go in unless he knows there's something seriously wrong. And he has been the difference in our campaign. He's given us hope, you know, that there, are, there is a way that we can stop them. So, I, you know, take it on board what he's saying. And I think it's really important to get to the courts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who wants to? Say anything resonates with what about people online? Do they have hands yeah, up? This is, uh, this is this is Patricia from Greek Bar Conservation Group. Just wanted to say, like, we have brilliant. Sorry, 
you can go, yeah. We are listening yeah. to you. I'm just saying we have brilliant environmental legislation north and south of the border. Um, all the EU habitat directives and 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 yet the law is thwarted at every turn. It's thwarted by the Office of Public Works, the uh, Electricity Service, uh, Kilcha, the State Forestry Service, um, and so. I mean, look at Derry Bryan. It took 16 years for European courts to adjudicate on the one farm disaster there, the bog slide. We've just had Mean Bog, where a one farm in Donegal has uh, polluted two rivers in Tyrone. And I mean, how long is that going to take to adjudicate? Really, can we really afford to? I mean, we can't. We have to go through the courts as far as we can. But at the end of the day, the experts are all in the local community. That's I'd say to people, you know, the experts on farming, on ecology. Uh, I don't mean academic experts, of course, but local people have a lot of local knowledge and not to forget that, you know, and to include that and the cultural knowledge, as Nock Ivory was saying. Um, it's no secret that these uh, industrialists are targeting sparsely populated Celtic areas in, in Donegal and along the west coast of Ireland. Uh, they're poor areas and um, that goes for mining, miners as well, you know, but uh, as, as well as the wind farm miners. But um, local people have the knowledge and uh, get that knowledge out there and Yes, go as far as you can, but at the end of the day, can we really afford down here in the south? It's 20 pounds, 20 euro for every initial planning application uh, objection. Then when you go in forestry, it goes up to 200 then to appeal a decision. In, uh, in Board Panola, it's 250 euro at the planning board in Dublin to appeal a decision. And then you've got to go to judicial review. And down here, the law isn't so clear cut. For, for judicial review, you will you can actually be held accountable for the funds and people have been I told that on the steps of the four courts. I mean, that 80 metre mass that was put up illegally here on the Guibara, we would have taken that to judicial review, except that we know, I mean, it was put up during bird nesting season and uh, we, we know we have to conserve our funds for an appeal against an industrial wind farm. So somebody somewhere is sitting saying, let's industrialise this whole valley. Irish water want to steal the water from the locks uh, up on top of the mountains. Uh, ESB want to put through high voltage power lines. So like uh, what chance has wildlife? We think really that we've got to preserve as much land as we can. We can't have any more digging. No more digging anywhere for any reason. Like it's just ridiculous. They're taking a million, a, a million tons of sand out of Loch Ney and nobody's doing anything about it. You know, they want to have uh, the Lords, that is. Um, and we have corporate Lords here doing the same thing, uh, multinationals. Uh, and it's just, just people have to, we, we all have to do something. But I mean, I'm, I'm not young, but I can't see if they, if we fail a judicial review, then we will have to set up a camp and roadblocks because otherwise they're going to put us out of our homes. And um, that's all I'd like to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, comment. Um, Anne, I can see you have turned your camera on. Do you want to say something? Hello, yes, I just really wanted to come in and um, back up what Cathy said about Gordon. Um, pick his brains. He's a really, really brave, courageous innovator um, and a justice, fighter for justice. I mean, the, the entire legal system is it's, it's, it's hugely expensive. And can I just also say to the chap from Queen's who was saying, you know, we've got environmental lawyers, we've got planners and so on and um, come and pick our brains for a pint. Totally taking me up on that. That's a great thing. Do that. <clears throat> but, you know, the idea that you can actually do a lot more yourself than you think you can is absolutely true. Um, I think in the beginning it feels baffling and then you gradually find out that actually, as, it, as I said today earlier on, on some on some things, I think we actually know more about the, the planning regulations than the planners do. 
I mean, it it was it was shocking to me to discover just how just how little they appeared to know whether they they knew more than they were letting on. I don't know, but um, but yeah, if you can find you know if you can find the, the courage to stand up. Um, which is not easy, and I have to say, at the beginning of our campaign, none of us wanted to stand up. I still, I still don't think we do really, um, but it does get easier the more often you do it. Um, and I know that nobody likes to stick their neck out, especially in the country. Um, and I really sympathise with the Go Buyer campaign because, you know, sometimes you could feel quite vulnerable. Um, but it's interesting to see how how things change and how many people you actually do have behind you as soon as you do start speaking up um as 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 so many of the campaigns have already proved you're not on your own but you do have to be a little bit brave to start with um and i think gordon's a very brave chap and hopefully he can inspire some more bravery um, from some more people because he's right ultimately authorities will not do the right thing unless you force them to i, I think especially whenever they've already started down a path that is um either either a mistake or dysfunction or or something worse than that but they're they're very they're very bad at admitting mistakes um and unfortunately you're going to have to force them to do that and i will even go further and say that i don't know how popular it will be to say this but i don't think we have a particularly sympathetic minister in place either um it's uh, you know we've been asking for him we really hope that when storm would go back that that you know there might be some shift because civil servants aren't accountable in the way that politicians are but um, my experience and our experience, and I know the experience of other groups is the same, that um, unfortunately our, some of our politicians aren't at all accountable and, and she's one of them. So yeah, tell her that when she comes knocking on your doors. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Uh, yes, please, can I give you this? It's just so that they can hear you. And please say your name. Yeah, so I'm Noah, I'm with Saver Lagan as well. Um, and just over the past couple of weeks i've kind of been learning a lot more like my background with conservation was um i spent my summers in the states with my uh grandpa who worked for the forest service for 20 years of his life um exploring the uh it's called the the bitterroot cellway wilderness area which is 5,300 square kilometers. And to put that in perspective, Northern Ireland is 14,000 square kilometers. So it's a third the size of this entire state. Um, and just from that, it's it's kind of led me forward to want to stand up because we don't even have a national park in Northern Ireland, um, let alone any kind of anything like wilderness areas, which are completely protected. You can't take anything more than uh, a lighter off the off the roads that run through them um, in terms of mechanical devices. It's sort of one of those things where a kind of a long term goal, I think, or even mid, sort of a, a mid range time scale could be trying to establish some kind of national park somewhere in Northern Ireland that has protection, um, be that the Mourns, Sparrens, Lagan Valley Regional Park becoming a national park. It, it, we need something like that to have protection for a vast area of our natural environment um, so that would be kind of my uh, the outcome of like the whole group as a group as a whole could be to get something like that in place um, that's kind of my my two cents on uh, kind of the, the overarching goal for this um, this campaign group of groups I would agree that um, anything that we can do to get a change that will set a precedent and then we can build on that and it'll snowball and that's the only way we'll um, because planning uses that planning will the planning plan committee will tell you this over and over again we can't turn this down because the precedent has been set on the bit of land beside it or and it just um, you know that's why in particular I keep going back to Hampton Meadows because that's just what I know about at the minute but uh, we've seen um, drawings that show where the developer is looking to keep on building right down to Galwally Stream. It's, it's like two meadows in Belfast in an area of outstanding natural beauty in between Lag and Lands East, which has been destroyed by the Lag and Gateway project. I don't care what councillors think, but they have made a disaster there. They've destroyed the wild, best wildlife habitat in South Belfast, possibly. Um, and uh, the 
the it's beside Beaver Forest as well, and it's also the River Lagan. So Lagan Lands East, Beaver Forest Park, and um, what they've ended up doing is creating a whole pincer movement of development. You've got luxury houses getting built in Mornington Gate that were passed by planning. He really didn't want to pass it, but somebody got outvoted or NIEA said, there's nothing wrong with can mitigate. We'll close up all the badger sets and then they'll have nowhere to go. But they got run over on Annadale Embankment on a regular basis. And there's one trying to live in behind Annadale Green. Uh, so that's, that's what happened. That's what NIEA talks about mitigation. So it's um, they talk about this precedent set and we think that there is now going to be a precedent about zoning of land for housing and that might come in with the is it the local development development area plan or the local area development plan um everybody needs to have eyes on those whenever they're published everywhere and everybody goes through them with a fine tuned comb and we all have this knowledge now that we know we know what we're looking for in these development plans because you need to get in at the very beginning if you don't get in at the very beginning it's like an uphill battle all the way and as I say, it's that precedent set because we think in Hampton Park, they've got this great illustrations where it shows you them going for phase three in an area that is not zoned for housing and then going for phase four across into an even better meadow with far more wild um, biodiversity and possibly building a marina there because it's all about opening the lagging up, getting water broached, the water quality, you know, um, you're, you know, you know the disaster that this is. <laughs> well, that's Jeffrey Donaldson's behind the marina. So anyway, it's all <laughs> right. That's my. Uh, <laughs> At, um, he wants to. Um, yeah, probably this month we'll be advertising for it. For one that's working with the farmers under a, a pilot environmental farming scheme, so we're trying to improve water quality by doing soil tests and working with farmers and all volunteers, yeah. Oh, about 30 volunteers. Okay, so yeah, um, thank you very, very much everyone for attending. This is not a good, um, uh, this uh, um, meeting. It's, it's great to see you, to hear your stories. And I think we shall try to organize another one. Maybe uh, Colin has all the details. So maybe we can follow up uh, after this event. If there is anything that comes to your mind that you want to explore further with the, the other groups or that you want the university to come in, please send us an email through Colin and we'll provide the room, the space, the energy and the resources for that. OK, and I definitely want to speak to you about the judicial review because I'm part of the uh, Lagan Land East uh, campaign as a local resident and uh, it's uh, been postponed for uh, the final approval at the planning committee. So I want to give it a shot at the judicial review. Amanda, sorry, I <laughs> didn't give you the opportunity. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Teresa, just just one last point. Uh, thank yourself and Colin and Teresa for organizing the event and for everybody who contributed. And just um, one thought that came to mind and you were saying Teresa, about the next step, step will be sharing information or organizing a, a meeting. I'm wondering, could we in advance the next meeting have some sort of database to begin sharing the kind of the campaigns that, that people are already doing? So we, we're, we're mapping that and then to begin sharing information about things that are coming on the line that are relevant to other campaigns. So that last lady that spoke mentioned um, about new planning. Um, issues that we're, they're aware of that so we can all tune in so you know if there's a, a piece of consultation that we need to all connect in with that we all know about it so whether it's planning piece whether it's the office of environmental protection that vivian mentioned um other consultation are going down the line as well but it'd be really useful if we can collectively share that information and look at how we can pull our resources and contribute 
together. Like as John mentioned, as academics, you know, John and I co-direct Queen's Centre for Sustainability, Equality and Climate Action. We have resources here that we can support with, both in terms of the physical resources, but also our own research and expertise as well. So, you know, if we can share that resources, it might be a nice interim step until we can all meet again. That's just my last last suggestion. And also just to re say thank you so much for a really brilliant meeting. Really, really enjoy it. Thanks, everybody. Just on that, um, there's a, a thing that I use. Uh, it's a there's an it's an app and uh, like a, a computer program called Discord. It's um, something that it, it's hard to describe. It's like basically multiple WhatsApp group chats, but all in one place, like all in one sort of server. I've I've used it with a lot of different applications. Universities use it all the time for certain things uh, within uh, like organizations. But it would allow us to have like like a, a, a chat almost like a chat room to be able to discuss current events but also channels for every single one of our uh movements to be able to share information specific to that um and it, there's it's a really powerful tool you can share audio um files images videos anything you want pretty much through that i'd be happy to set it up it's it's all free um that's the thing it's uh, something I could get set up over the course of a weekend and we could get it all all together. Yes, um, it, it's it's quite similar to that. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we can have like we can have a general chat where we can just if, if we want to just chat about stuff. It's there, um, and like I said, I can get it set up. I use it regularly. I've had a lot of experience with it, um, and I can share that. It's a join link. You just download a program onto your computer or off the app store on your phone, and you just click the link and join, and that's it, and you're in. So I could get that. Yes, great. Anything else we want to share? Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone then. It's